Haven for Hope unlocks the embedded potential of a forgotten part of San Antonio. And with it, it unlocks the embedded potential of thousands of people in the city overcoming homelessness. I'm Rick Archer. I'm a founding principal with Overland Partners Architects. When I was 22, I met Tom, a 19-year-old homeless man. Manic, depressive, schizophrenic. He was selling his body to get a meal to support his habits. In a moment of naivety, I invited Tom to be my roommate because no one should ever be homeless. And yet in America today, there's two and a half million people a year who are homeless. And before Haven for Hope in my city, San Antonio, there was 25,000 people, 4,500 at any point in time. The average age, nine years old. We were spending approximately $225 million a year in the city to maintain the status quo. And a forgotten part, a vacant part of downtown had become their de facto home a wasteland. That's where we chose to build Haven for Hope. The process we used was radically inclusive. It began by surveying and interviewing the homeless, finding out what they needed. We went into community workshops that included the homeless. We did bench parking trips. We did peer reviews. We invited five other architecture firms to work with us because the project was so critical. And we co-located on site with the project manager and the construction manager. What emerged was a concept, one stop, for all the people regardless of their age, their homeless status, or their gender. The solution, we repurposed 22 acres of downtown, reimagined it as a vital part of the city, not a wasteland. We took 150,000 square feet of warehouses and converted that into counseling, education, and support services. And we built 150,000 square feet of new housing. At the heart of the whole complex, a village green, a place where the community could gather, where the homeless wouldn't just be a number, but they would be members, a place because everyone needs to belong. We imagined a physical place that would become a place for, where, where the homeless could find their place. The member experience, 86% are overcoming homelessness. They're out of the war zone. They're being re-enfranchised into their community. And the human impact has been enormous. 25,000 homeless a year has become 3,300. Our point in time count went from 4,500 to 450. We're serving 25,000 homeless people a year in the center. It saved the city $3 billion over 20 years and crime has reduced 13%. Haven for Hope, the largest homeless center in the world is a physical transformation of the city that is transforming humans in the city. 200 delegations from cities in 40 countries around the world have been there to see it. We're currently working in Ghana, Namibia, Guatemala, Croatia, Australia, New Zealand, and all across the United States to affect change for the marginalized in a similar way. 15 years after I met Tom and he lived with me, his body was found on the side of the street. A book was in his hand. They identified him by the inscription that I'd written. No one should die like that. No one should live like that. Haven for Hope is my personal response. It's my city's response. We've got to move design from problem solving to changing lives. Together, we can do that in the communities we live. And we do, when we do, no one no one will ever have to be homeless again. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Cliff. That's amazing. Thank you, Cliff. So um, I'm wondering, what, what kind of food service do you have? We work with the food bank. They provide the food at no cost. We have volunteers who prepare it. My office goes down there on a regular basis. We prepare the food with other volunteers. There's an outside courtyard, and they get a hot meal outside for people who don't want to come inside. And for the inside, there's a cafeteria where families and everyone dine together. 
I think all of us are really moved. So thank you for not only sharing the work, but sharing a personal side of it. Because I feel like, especially with an issue like this, it touches on our humanity. So thank you for that. Thanks, um, my question is, because I'd love to see other cities replicate this, can you tell us just a little bit more? I think you did a great opening for this, but understanding the level of investment needed for a city to be able to build this at scale. So yeah. what it takes for another city to adopt a model like this. Well, I think every city ought to adopt different models. You know, the uniqueness of this is we solved the problem in San Antonio, just like we're solving it in Croatia today. I spent last week in Croatia meeting with the communities trying to understand their needs, and they're so different than San Antonio. But what we found is that we have to begin by caring about human outcomes, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or whether that's at a massive scale. San Antonio spent $100 million to create this center, all private philanthropy. We're not a rich city, but we care very deeply about our people. And when you, when you create an environment, when you, when you do something in a way that really makes a difference, then the community will come forward and they'll invest. My firm ended up giving half of our profit that year, $700,000 to Haven for Hope, because we believe so strongly in the project. So uh, the ongoing run rate cost, is that still funded by private philanthropy, or has the city taken over the management, given all of the figures around the taxpayer cost? Great question, Joe. Um, a small portion is funded by the city. It, the operating costs are about $14 million a year. The city gives us about $2 million. The rest of it is raised through private philanthropy entirely. Um, I have a question about, um, are there any criteria for homeless individuals to be first granted a housing unit and second to, to stay within the housing complex long term? For example, by that I mean, are there any uh, job pro training programs or vocational training programs that residents uh, are encouraged to partaking in order to be a part of this community? Yeah, actually, anyone can come into what we call Prospects Courtyard, which is outdoor living. No questions asked, stay as long as you want. But if you want to get services, if you want to get uh, development, job development, for example, then you have to be willing to sign up to, with a social worker. Uh, and as long as you stay, stay with the program, uh, then you can live there. And once you've moved out, you can continue to come back for supportive services forever. Once a member, always a member. In addition to that, we have services we provide for the surrounding neighborhood, health care, dental, child care, uh, as a way to really be good neighbors with everyone around. Do you no? have drug and alcohol requirements? Uh, you know, it's interesting. The, the shelter that was providing services before said about 20% of the men were uh, drug addicted, substance abusers. It turned out to be about 80%. Fortunately, we had designed tremendous flexibility into the, into the facility, so we created an on-site detox and rehab unit, uh, and most of the men end up going there first. Nella, and Nella? I think you had a question. Um, can you say a couple more design details that really help you achieve the goals of this project? Sure. Um, I think I mentioned one is that we restored it to the city. Two, we had men, women, and children living in the same place, which was critical to creating a vibrant, real life situation, a small detail. And um, I'm the going to have to cut you off there and we'll have to ask you in, at the, okay. about the small detail later. So thank you for that. Thank and you Thank you for your much. presentation.